we're going to start a new series called the the napkin dream uh, the napkin dream is uh, is the journey of joseph's life joseph is one guy who had a dream and saw it come true in his own life some of us have dreams but really don't really you know follow them in order to see them fulfilled we did this series 6 years ago it was so effective i realized a lot of our church members were encouraged to pursue their dreams and some of them in fact saw their dreams come into fulfillment so we thought hey we we will rewind it revamp it nicely this time we'll you know and present it again so we're going to do a journey through joseph's life in learning how do we see what we dream come to fulfillment uh, we'll start that from the third week of february so don't miss it in fact get your friends uh, it doesn't matter if they're christians or not christians it's really going to help them uh, to to have to see how uh, if we really put our mind to our dreams we can actually see them come to a petition to fulfill it is it okay all right so talk to your friends and bring them uh, and maybe along with you they will also be benefited so talking about leaders and dreamers i want to talk about uh, a principle a life that is worth living worth following a leader that is worth following i want to talk on that topic today just a it's a it's a it's based on one single verse that kind of caught my attention from the book of hebrews so open to book of hebrews chapter 13 Uh, and i'm going to read that one single verse verse 7 um and um give you a um do a simple exposition of the out of that verse today just to you know take take with us uh hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 let me before i read that let me just give you a context of what the book of hebrews is how many of you ever read the book of hebrews okay oh quite a number of you good it's one of those Uh, one of those books that can you know first few chapters you kind of ah, i'm not getting through this kind of book but if you actually pay attention to the book of hebrews it's one of the most prolific books in the bible he the author of the the book of hebrews is probably one of the best writers you will ever see he what he is whom i call the first apologist in my opinion the guy who built a perfect argument about who christ is how supreme christ is if you ever have a question uh, if you ever want to be equipped enough to defend your faith against any religious attack this would be the book you should read you see the first seven chapters he focuses on building an argument for the supremacy of christ who christ is and why christ is supreme over the angels and moses and so called you know um, um, religious leaders how is he greater than everybody else that's his argument the first uh, seven chapters and then chapter 8 and chapter 9 he focuses uh, chapter 8 chapter 9 and chapter 10 he focuses on the supremacy of the covenant that jesus made at the cross uh, why what jesus did on the cross matters to us that's what he discusses on that um, so basically he puts up, puts forward builds up this argument on why only christ is the is the uh, the way to heaven the way to be saved why cross alone is the uh, way to be saved believing in what christ has done on the cross is the is the way to salvation so uh, he builds that argument there and then the la- later part of that that book chapter 10 11 sorry 11 12 and 13 he talks about the supremacy of the way which we follow now whatever christ proposed we are following now a, we are not following a religion we are following a way and why is that supreme that's what he discusses the last part of the book of hebrews chapter 10 chapter 11 and chapter 12 and he kind of brings to the, to our attention that it is faith alone on which your life is based on faith and obedience are the two keys for christian um christian faith if if i have to put it that way uh, if you want to be a christian true christian there are two requirements from you faith and obedience that's what he talks on that as he comes closing uh, comes to closing his argument um in chapter 13 he then turns his attention on to simple practical life principles for us what are the things that we must do what are the things that we must not do and you know some of those principles that we can apply in our practical life and that's that's what he discusses in chapter 13 but one verse um for, you know really caught my attention i just want to read that for you chapter 13 verses 7 Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of the good that has come out of their lives. 
and follow the example of their faith. In NIV, let me read the same words in New International Version. Some of you have New International Versions. This is what it says. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. And imitate their faith. So he, this is what he's trying to say. If you want to ever want to be a leader that inspires somebody else. If you want to live a life that others would consider following. There are three qualities that you must exhibit through your life. Number one, your message should be worth remembering. Because they, you know, the leaders who made an impression on the world has a message that, is, that was worth remembering. Your message should be worth remembering. Number two, the outcome of your life should be worth considering. The people should be able to look at your life, pay attention to your life because of the outcome that came out of your life. Your message should be worth considering, worth remembering. Your life should be worth considering. Number three, your faith should be worth following, worth imitating in other words. Three qualities of an inspirational leader. Three qualities of any person who wants to inspire others. Some of you are like, man, that topic is not for me. I'm not a leader. I don't do anything. I'm not even in the, you know, in the middle management. I'm at the lower rung in my, in my company. I want you to know this. Everyone is a leader. Every one of you is a leader. John Maxwell uh, defines leadership like this. The leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. That means any person who influences somebody else is a leader. By definition. It seems all of us influence at least 30,000 people in our lifetime. Even if we do it, do anything actively or, or, or not, even if you live your life in entire passivity, you will still influence more than 30,000 people in your lifetime. That means 30,000 people make decisions, shape their lives based on who you are, what you do, what you say. So whether you like it or not, every one of you is a leader. Whether you are in uh, a higher rank in your company, at the highest position uh, in your business, or whether you are in the middle management, whether you are a just a team leader or team player. It doesn't matter. Wherever you are, whatever you do, you are a leader. Irrespective of your educational qualification, irrespective of your social status, irrespective of your, your religion, your color, your family background, you are a leader. And that means you are somebody who is going to influence people. But a leader should not only be an influence, he should be inspirational. That's my point. That you should be somebody who, whom people remember, consider. Every one of you, even if you are a homemaker. Well, actually, I say homemakers are the greatest leaders in this world. It's a true, true statement. If your mom does not pay attention to you, you will never become a better person in your life. Or if your dad is a homemaker, if he doesn't pay attention to you, you're never going to make it in your life. So, homemakers, you shouldn't feel shy. You are number one leaders in this world. So, therefore, this message is for everyone. That you now start think, taking your life seriously because you are somebody who's going to... Um, you know, influence people and therefore you better be a person who inspires others. Before I talk about that, let me just, uh, just do a little sidetrack and talk about imitation and inspiration. Can I do that? There's a difference between imitation and inspiration. Most of us imitate people thinking that we are inspired by them. We, you know, it's good to admire great leaders. It's good to, uh, you know, see what they have achieved. It's good to follow them. But, um, Unconsciously or sometimes consciously, we try imitating them, copying them, copy-pasting everything that they have said, everything that they have done, and thus, in the process, we lose our originality as leaders. Let me clarify that with three statements. Imitation leads to comparison. That's the first problem with copy-pasting. Imitation leads to comparison. 
the re- once you start copy pasting somebody else you start comparing yourself with that person you start comparing with uh, how, how you know how much you have achieved along with them uh, like them and then the moment you start doing that the moment you start comparison comparison will lead you to competition it will make you competitive not uh, not uh, not develop competency but you become competitive since you are unable to outdo the other person you will now become more competitive in your nature now here is the problem with competitiveness competition leads to compromise the moment you start competing with others and trying to be like them there's a chance that because you are unable to achieve the same kind of success that they have achieved you will then tend to compromise on your values and your ethics in order to reach that that's the danger in imitation you see comparison is the death of creativity you will stop thinking creatively innovatively if we start if you start comparing your life yourself with somebody else and try to be like them you can't be but what you can do is to draw inspiration from them draw inspiration from them here is what happens when you draw inspiration inspiration leads to innovation once you draw inspiration from people who have achieved something great with their lives you then become more creative more innovative in your ideas in the way that you do things because uh, you want to be best in what you do and innovation naturally leads to improvement any leader if he needs to grow become better he needs to be innovative and the more innovative you become the more creative you become with the resources that you got in your hand with the time that you got in your hand with the uh, the force manual force that you got in your hand the more creative you become the better leader you become you improve one of the best qualities of a leader is that he constantly improves i was talking to my team this morning uh, dream team and i told them i'm uh, i've been teaching to teaching them on um how to be a good teammate from the life of jonathan jonathan is one classic teammate he knows how to play by team rules he knows how to follow a leader he himself is a leader but he knows how to follow a leader uh so i i was teaching them and i told them one of the best things about jonathan is that he learns from his mistakes quickly he is not afraid to admit his mistakes that should be the quality of a good leader because he constantly is looking for improvement Does it make sense? So, innovation, inspiration leads us to innovation. Innovation leads us to improvement. Improvement obviously leads us to influence. The better you become at something, the more people start paying attention to you. If nobody is paying attention to you, it simply means you are not good at your job. Sorry. It's true. On the day Darren Sami, who is Darren Sami? Some of you. I like I don't know who's Darren Sami. I know. By himself if you take him aside he's just a normal player. But as a team as a leader when he led his team the West Indian cricket team led to a world cup win in Eden Gardens Calcutta and stood in the middle of the ground as he lifted this cup and talked about Jesus. People paid attention. 1 billion Indians paid attention. to a west uh, you know west indian who talked about jesus in a in a country like ours people pay attention to you to your message when you are good at what you do that's called influence i'll come to that a little more uh, as i progress in the message so if you can understand the difference between imitation and inspiration let's talk about how do we live our life to inspire others um, there are three things right the author of hebrews focused on that verse uh, the first part of that verse remember your leaders who taught you the word of god there he is talking about the message the message that comes verbally and non verbally through your life we our problem is most of the time just think about this it's just naturally a christian problem our problem is we tend to compare a messenger with a messenger we tend to compare a pastor with a pastor preacher with a preacher 
when we should compare a message with another message. It's a very important principle to remember, Christians. Now we should always weigh the word of God on the basis of the word of God. Not the messenger to messenger. That's our problem. We tend to compare people, um, people with other people. We should compare people with the message. Uh, one message to another message. And that's why message is important. What comes out of my mouth? What comes out of my life? What kind of message I'm sending out makes a lot of difference. That's why he's saying, consider the message that they taught to you. He says. Now a message is worthless unless it is from God. Because there are a lot of people who can talk a lot. Articulate beautiful words, you know, knit them together to become, uh, to make it sound so beautifully and, uh, you know, sound. But yet, many of them have spoken before and none of their words are remembered. But a message becomes worth remembering if it is coming from God. Any person who is inspired by the word of God and spoke the word of God, people remember that message. People may not remember the messenger, but the message. When you speak your life, whatever it speaks of, people should, if people have to remember that, then your life should be, uh, your message should be from God. So unless your message is from God, it's, it, it isn't worth listening to, remembering. Now, that simply means you have to listen to God. Now here is the problem. Unless your heart is still, you can't hear God. Unless your heart is still, you can't hear God. Psalm 37 verses 7, the psalmist says this. Be still and know that He is God. Many of us must have been Christians for a long time. I know this is a younger audience now. But most of you have been part of Christian homes, grew up as Christians, gone to church almost every single Sunday, almost like a ritual, 52 days in a year, 52 Sundays, and plus four extra programs. You did not miss even one of them. It could be possible that you have attended every single thing that your church does, and yet never received anything from God. When your heart is restless, you can't hear. When, you, when your heart is filled with anxiety and fear, you don't pay attention to God. In Genesis chapter 35, there's a story of God speaking to Jacob. Think about Jacob. All his life, up to that point, he lived restlessly. From the moment he cheated his brother and received the blessing of Esau from his father Isaac, Jacob knew his life is in danger. His elder brother is going to kill him. So he was on the run. All his life, he was on the run. From one place to another place, to another place, to another place. Always in hiding. Always restless. He was so restless. Even after becoming one of the richest people who lived on the earth at that point of time, he would still hide things. He would, he would separate himself from his family because of the fear that his enemies would attack his family because of him. Fear-filled heart, in spite of becoming successful in his business, successful in everything that he had done uh, in his journey, in spite of receiving the blessing from dad, he lived restlessly. Some of you could be enjoying success in your workplace, but your heart is restless. Unable to hear the voice of God. So God gives a solution to Jacob in chapter 35. Meets him and he says, hey Jacob, get up. I want to talk to you. Get to Bethel. Bethel is a place God speaks. You know, that's what it means. Get to Bethel. So Jacob gets up. God still doesn't say what he wants to speak to him. Simply says, I want you to go to Bethel. I can speak to you there. So he gets up. The first thing that he does is he calls his entire family. This family is one of the most colorful family. Nobody knows who's a Christian in that form. You know that? So he calls them and he says, hey, purify yourselves. 
How do you purify yourself? Take out all the idols in the home. That means Jacob allowed idolatry into his home. He allowed everybody's ideology to work. Okay, you believe like this, you believe like this, you believe like this, I'll believe like this. He knew that's not something that he needs to follow. You know, in a, in a, in a culture where relativism is, is now uh, encouraged, um, the more urban we are becoming, the more um, globalized we are becoming, we think we should be more relative when it comes to ideologies now. You can't be. Truth is exclusive. Jacob realized that. He's got to get rid of things that are stopping his family from being pure. So he says, purify yourselves. Take out all the idols from the home. He takes everything, digs a big ditch in front of his home, in his tent, uh, under a tree, puts all the idols there and buries them. Then he comes back to his family and he says, take out your old clothes, wear new clothes, clean clothes. Almost in a symbolic expression of, I'm leaving my old self, I'm going to be a new person from today. Then he takes his entire family from that place. After they purified themselves, got rid of the things that are stopping them from knowing God, and then, uh, uh, you know, changing their lifestyle, he takes them to Bethel. And now God speaks to Jacob at Bethel. When he speaks to Bethel, uh, Jacob on that day, in chapter 35, you begin to see um, a, a beautiful thing unfold there. God's now... God is saying, hey Jacob, I'm going to change your name from Jacob to Israel. Everybody thinks you're a deceiver. In fact, they call you a deceiver. You yourself think that you're a, know that you're a deceiver and um, you know the state of your life. I'm going to change that and make you somebody else, Israel. But not just that. Because of what you have done, I'm going to bless you. I'll bless you so much that you're from you, within your family, kings will arise. You're not only you, but your descendants will be blessed because of you. Because of what you have just done today. And then he goes on to say, people will remember you, Jacob. Every time they think of me, they'll think of you. What an honor, huh? So here, is, here it is. When you have a settled heart, you bet you get to listen to God. When you have a settled heart, your life gets to change. When you have a settled heart, you get a blessing from God, not just for you, but your entire children and their children and their children, the generations that to come. And, that, and then every time people think of God, they'll think of you. Just by a settled heart. Unless your heart is still, you can't hear God. Could it be possible that you did not deal with your unforgiveness? You did not deal with your um, impure lifestyle. You did not deal with your sin. And then uh, you lost the ability to hear the voice of God. And that's why whatever you're speaking, your message is not worth remembering. Unless your heart is still, you can't hear. Unless you are willing to listen, you cannot. That's another thing. As I told you, you could go to every single meeting and if you're not paying attention, God cannot speak to you. Every time Jesus spoke on the earth, if you go through the Gospels, you will begin to see this interesting pattern emerge. He talks to people, teaches them important truths, and then he says, everyone who has ears, let them... Listen, why would Jesus say that? Does that mean people don't have ears? You have the same question. And Jesus answers that question. He says, yeah, I know you have ears. Some of you have ears, but you don't actually pay attention. You don't listen. If you're not willing to listen to God, He can't talk to you. You can't come to Sunday service on a Sunday morning and, and just, just walk in because it's just a thing that is, a, that is a ritual thing for you and expect God to speak to you. If you're not ready, God can't speak to you. Cannot. In, in fact, in the book of Isaiah, God speak through, speaks through his prophet. I can't speak to my people because they won't pay attention to me. 
they're not willing to listen to me why would i speak to them not that he doesn't want to speak to you not that he can't speak to you but that you won't let him speak to you how many sundays have you wasted simply by not paying attention and unable to receive i was telling in the morning service it could be possible that you followed us for the last uh, last month in the 21 day fasting and prayer you simply fasted but never prayed you fasted because the church is fasting you fasted because your pastor asked you to fast you thought that would be a cool thing to do and did not actually take time to talk to god spent time listening to his voice now you can't sit here and wonder why didn't god speak to me in the last 21 days he can't you didn't pay attention unless you're willing to listen he can't speak to you number 3 unless you're willing to listen completely he can't speak to you two years ago i did a series called whisper based on the book written by the same name by uh, mark batterson talking about how do you listen to the voice of god how do you recognize what is voice of god and what is not from god if you have that question you need to go back to our youtube channel and listen to that it's a beautiful series or just pick this book whispered by mark batterson um the story of samuel is a very interesting one for samuel chapter 3 uh, god speaks to a little boy 3 year old 5 year old what does it matter just a small kid he doesn't know uh, how does the voice of god sound like that's why he ran to eli right in the next room and trying to ask him uh, oh, did you call me did you call me did you call me did you call me because he doesn't know it was god speaking to him never heard the voice of god he doesn't know how voice of god sounds like but in the other room that guy knows he knows what the voice of god sounds like 65 plus been a christian has has been there done that done this built churches did massive crusades millions followed he is the best televangelist there was he was a prophet did you know that eli was a prophet not just a priest but a prophet a well known man big established ministry <clears throat> in the other room why would god choose to speak to this little boy who can't recognize the voice of god instead of a guy who is an expert in the voice of god have you ever thought about it it's because of chapter 2 in chapter 2 god did speak to eli god did tell him hey this is my will this is what i want you to do your two children the boys are not listening to me they're disobeying the commands of god consistently you better check on them you better discipline them do something about it otherwise these two guys are going to bring a calamity on the entire nation because of their sin so you better check your children i guess eli loved his children more than the voice of god so he didn't do anything about it to a point that god stopped speaking to him that he decides i don't care how big ministry you got i'm going to speak to this little one can you imagine this boy was born because of his prophecy well of course it is god who brought him there but that boy was dedicated to be his worker his servant as long as he lives before he becomes a prophet now he comes back to him talks back to him and says this is what god told me what an embarrassment isn't it don't come to a position as a parent that your child comes to you and talks to you about god you don't want to be there if you stop listening to him completely God will start speaking to your children and your grandchildren and then they'll come back and start talking to you unless your heart is still you can't hear unless you're willing to listen you cannot unless you're willing to listen completely you won't 
And as long as you don't receive anything from God, whatever you speak, nobody remembers that. Nobody cares. Does it make sense now? Your message should be worth remembering. Number two, your life should be worth considering. I like the NIV translation of that verse. Remember your, lead, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. I love it. It's not just their life. It's the outcome of their life that he wants us to consider. He's saying, look at your leaders. Look at people who have gone before you. Look at what came out of their life and consider that. Meaning, he's also telling us, live your life in such a way that people would see the outcome of your life and consider your life. Leaders, the outcome of your life does matter. I know we always talk about internal chain transformation and as long as I'm good inside, I'm fine. But what comes, what you produce outside also matters a lot. People pay attention to outcome. As I told you, Darren Sami on that day earned the right to talk about Jesus because of his excellence as a leader. People pay attention to you when you are the best at your work. When you are best at web designing or graphic designing, when you are best at mm, creating apps, and when you are best at banking, when you are best as a doctor, people will pay attention to you because you are the best. You earn the right to talk about Jesus. You earn the right to talk about uh, uh, you know, what makes you who you are. And people, no, no matter who they are, have to pay attention to you. They don't have a choice. A few years ago, I think, um, I spoke on um, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Just like this, this odd message, I did that message. On Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 1. It's one of the most fascinating verses for me. Here is how Solomon, the king who wrote the book, right? Ecclesiastes, introduces himself like this. I, the preacher, son of David, king of Israel. Listen to that. I, the preacher, the teacher, son of David, king of Israel. What an interesting way to introduce himself. We reverse that. I, the king of Israel, Son of David, the preacher. That's how we do. Solomon knew the right order. I, the teacher, son of David, king of Israel. My, my position is given to me only to be a teacher in the first place. The reason I'm in the position that I'm in today, the reason God is giving me the promotion that he's giving me today is not because he wants me to enjoy the power that it comes with, uh, you know, the kursi brings, but that I use the position to proclaim, to teach, earn the right to talk. Does it make sense? The whole world will pay attention to Solomon because he earned the right to be there. Did you earn the right to be there? How can you pray for promotions and bonuses if you didn't earn the right? How can you say, God, why don't you lift me up, give me a better job, give me a better position, when you are not using what the position that already God gave you to voice out, to be the best, in order to earn the right to voice out what you believe in? Does it make sense? A life is worth remembered, uh, remembering only if the outcome is good. What kind of outcome impresses people? Three things. I'm a three-point preacher, you know that, right? <laughs> I'll keep going back to three points. Number one, fruitfulness. People see the kind of fruit you're bearing. Fruitlessness is the result of selfishness. Remember that. Proverbs chapter 11. It's a beautiful chapter to read. I don't have time to explain. Uh, you know, read through that. But let me give you the references and I want you to go back and reread the, those verses. Can you do that? Can you do that? You better do that. Otherwise, you'll never improve as a leader. Um, chapter 11, verses 27 to 31. Four, three times, I think he talks about who is a righteous man and what happens to a righteous man when he does good deeds. Talks about how his life becomes fruitful. On the other side, he also talks about wicked people. What happens to wicked people? How 
they are forgotten how they are not given any reward in their lives proverbs chapter 11 27 to 31 he basically points out the reason for fruitlessness in evil people he says the reason they are unable to bear fruit in their lives the reason they they don't have life in them is because of their selfish nature they are people who are always thinking about themselves but a righteous man sows the seeds of goodness into others and he sees the fruit that's what bible says when you stop living for yourself and start living for others you'll start bearing fruit people stand up and pay attention to you they'll start seeing what you're doing why you're doing what you're doing fruitlessness well fruitfulness number 2 peacefulness any person who can stand withstand any kind of storm in his life gains attention by others if you're somebody who really don't get scared of when well, we are all scared at some point in our lives but don't give in because of the storms in your life people will pay attention to you they want to know why and how you can be like that isn't it true they'll pay attention to you verses 23 to 26 um he talks about generosity i'll come to generosity in a bit what has generosity to do with peace i want to talk about well in fact i don't want to talk about generosity but the opposite of that he uses two very specific words in those three verses 23 to 26 okay he's talking about giving away he's talking about giving nature of a good man on the other hand as uh, as this entire chapter does there is a com- comparison and contrast between a righteous man and an evil man so he talks about how, how an evil man a wicked person behaves he says he hoards all the wealth to himself now here is the pro- he, and then he uses another word he becomes stingy people don't like them because they are stingy he says evil people are hated by others cursed by others because of their stinginess that's the words so two words hoarding and stingy they two point me to an important aspect uh, um that we must remember is this that a person starts hoarding more becomes more stingy because he's discontent in life he's not satisfied with what he has when you are not satisfied with what with what god gave you you become discontent the moment you become discontent there are only two things you will start thinking i can't spend i want more does it make sense some of you are like hey, you're talking to me huh? you become discontent the moment your heart is discontent dissatisfied with what god gave you you become restless you lost your peace now see the connection that's why people who are generous are at peace all the time we always think people you know pastors talk about generosity because they want money nah yes of course that also because generosity brings peace to you when you give away you learn to live with contentment and that brings satisfaction that brings peace restlessness is a result of discontentment number 3 um same chapter i don't i didn't want to go other places because you will understand that i'm speaking exactly from the scripture i'm not trying to pick and choose right so that's why chapter 11 verses 3 to 6 he addresses an issue called dishonesty there talks about how there are many people who live their lives without any honesty they make money they're successful people do look to them but people don't want to follow them there may be some leaders you will like but you will never follow why because you know they're dishonest 
you know what they say and what they do don't match at all you like them you like what they do you like what they preach and all that stuff but you don't want to follow them because uh, there's no match if you are so careful in order to pick and choose who you want to follow or not follow on the basis of honesty and dishonesty don't you think your life should also be like that don't you think your children watch you learn from you whether you are honest or dishonest from your life and then simply replicate that your words your life is worth considering if you are honest but only a person who knows what his life is all about can stay honest can stay whole honest integrity means wholeness that you match your words with your actions okay so you it doesn't no matter what is happening no matter uh, uh, who is attacking you you don't compromise on anything because you know who you are you know why you are here you know what you're doing only a person who knows his purpose the life why god gave him his life only a person who's got single minded goal can stay whole honest so in other words this is what i'm saying aimlessness leads us to dishonesty that's what i'm saying watch a dishonest leader he never sticks to one goal he never sticks to one project even if he begins something great he never completes it does it make sense you got thousands of examples around you probably your boss is like that but a person who knows what his life means stays whole honesty integrity comes bring you know comes forth through his life that's a life worth following worth considering number 3 let's go to the third one message life faith remember your leaders who taught you the word of god think of all the good that has come out of their life and i like the nlt version and follow the example of their faith follow the example of their faith i love it that's why he spent an entire chapter on listing out the heroes of faith imitate their faith imitate their faith he's asking us to encouraging us to listen to their life look at their life and be inspired by them have the same kind of faith in your life you see Uh, why does why does he talk so much about faith he clarifies that in chapter 11 verse 6 it is without faith it is impossible to please god you can't be a christian without faith that's what he's trying to say you can never be a christian a follower of christ without faith but most of us struggle in the area of faith you know one of the hardest requests that we get when it comes to prayer i'm not trying to you know make fun of you if you did make that kind of prayer request it's an odd one to ask a pastor pastor can you pray so that i can increase in my faith you know why i'm telling that faith is born out of conviction i said it's odd i'm not making fun of it again faith is born out of conviction if you are not convinced of a truth you can never have faith in it now does it make sense now so you can't say can you ask god to increase in my faith it's an oxymoronic statement you can't say god is powerful and then ask to provide a different way and start thinking a different thing you know different solution for your problem our convictions remember this all these faith heroes that you see the heroics that they have done achieved in their lives are because of the conviction that they had their convictions in who god is their convictions in what god can do help them to have faith to conquer the world expect great things from god and attempt great things from god 
is a famous uh, uh, statement coined by William Carey. It's not a statement with some fancy words. It's a statement that is born out of a conviction. A conviction that if I attempt great things from God, by expecting great, great things from God, God will actually do them. If he didn't believe it, um, what we call a modern India wouldn't have existed. Do you know that? A man who could have settled his life well enough back in England as a cobbler. I don't know what, how much cobblers make in those days. But at least there, settled, fame, familiar, comfortable life. Because of his convictions that God wants to save India, that the gospel needs to reach out to our country, that there are millions of people who still have not heard of Jesus Christ and somebody has to take the gospel there. Because of his conviction that God, want, God loves Indians, that even though his own denomination denied a mission grant to him, saying that we're talking foolishness. In fact, when William Carey stood up and talked about world missions, they laughed at him in the church and denied him a grant. That he chooses to come to a strange country that he has never been to, take this arduous journey by faith, learn languages so that he can help people like you and me and have Bible in our own languages so that we can read and know God. He could do what he did because of a conviction. Convictions help us to conquer the world. That's why you have a book called Acts in the Bible. Not just to fill your curiosity or, uh, that God gave that history of church there in order to challenge you to look at how God is at work in this world. In order for you to see, you and me, to see how people with convictions can actually change the world. It doesn't matter if they are fishermen. It doesn't matter if they are people with less knowledge. They can change the world because of what they believe in. Convictions. Conviction gives birth to faith. Remember that. It is our conviction that helps us to experience miracles in our lives or perform a miracle through our lives. Peter, James and John walked up to uh, Peter and John walked up to this lame man at the temple. Remember the time that he was he, he's been there all his life, beggar. Because of the conviction that they had, a miracle took place on that day. There are four convictions every Christian must have. Can I do that with you? Especially as a Christian, you need to have these four convictions. Just take them with you as I bring this thought to conclusion. Number one, all things are possible. Christian leader must believe all things are possible. There is nothing that is impossible for us because we have a God who doesn't have impossibility in his dictionary. Anything is possible. Number two, anything is possible in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you remember, while he was on the earth, said this. That if you ask anything in my name to the Father, the Father would do it. Anything is possible in Jesus' name. That's why Peter James, Peter and John, looks at this guy at the uh, temple. And they say, we don't have silver or gold. But in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. See the conviction? That if we ask anything in the name of Jesus, it's possible. We don't actually believe that. If your child is sick, you panic. The first thing you do is panic. I'm not saying don't take them to the hospitals. Eh? I'm just saying that's not the reaction a Christian should have. That's my point. That you should have, 
If you if you you should have enough conviction to lay your hand. You don't need Pastor Chaitanya to come. That you should have enough conviction to lay your hand and pray for your child and believe that in Jesus' name he can be healed. If you don't have conviction about it, you cannot have faith. And if you don't have faith, that doesn't work. Your prayer does it make sense now. All things are possible. All things are possible in the name of Jesus. Number three. All resources will come. Anything that you require in order to see those things that you are trying to attempt to do will come. You got to believe that whatever you choose to do in the name of God for God's glory. God will provide everything that you need. When um, one of the constant um, struggles in my mind when I do prayer walks in the morning times, and it's a pleasant walk in the morning, by the way, to walk on this road, no traffic, and to watch all these buildings, high-rise buildings, come up. There are so many times I ask this question to God. How come everybody has buildings? Why not us? Where does this guy? You know, every time we look at buildings, we wonder where do these guys get money? I mean, how are you allowing them to have money, God? Why not me? Everybody is building sky views and sky highs, and why not our church? Why can't we have that? Sometimes it's disheartening to see everybody gobbling up the lands and building up huge buildings, and while you are here, still waiting for two more weeks to talk about Dream Center. It's 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 especially when you prayer walk, it's disheartening. But the Spirit of God, every time I thought about that, He would speak into my heart and say, "On time." Not a day before, not a day later. On time, all resources will come on time. You see, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood against King Nebuchadnezzar, who is threatening them to kill with a furnace that has now become seven times fiercer than before. What they said is unbelievable statement, isn't it? We love it. How God is able to save us? They have no idea how He will save them. A God is able to save us from this fiery furnace. No clue as to how. How is it even logically possible for God to save you once you are thrown into a fiery furnace? When the people who are trying to increase the fire there are themselves dying because of the heat that is coming out. How, how can you believe that unless you are so convinced in your heart? Everything will come on time. All help will come on time. Not a day before. Not a day later. Does it make sense now? And that's why they were able to say that. My God can save me. He's able to save me. All resources will come on time. Number four. And here is the most important statement. Okay, God is absolute. God is in absolute control of everything. <clears throat> I never get tired of this. I never get up. Never get tired of saying this. If you are an old Capstonian, you know what what is about to come. But if you are hearing it thousand times, still hear it one more time. God is the boss. I, lo I, I love the sound of it. God is the boss. He is in absolute control of everything: your life, your job, your circumstance, even Satan. Nothing ever. Slips away from his hands. He doesn't loosen his grip. He's got a very tight hold on entire creation, 
on history on everything he never loses his grip god is an absolute control of every thing do you know why you need to believe this because of what chadrak meshak and abednego said next i know god is able to save me from this fiery furnace i don't know how he's going to save me but he will save me if needed the fourth guy will come he they don't know the fourth guy is going to come right they just know something can happen then he goes on to make this statement and he says this but even if he does not he still the boss sometimes you lose job sometimes you lose the people you love the most but he is still the boss god is in absolute control of everything if you remember those conviction if you have those convictions man faith will come forth in any circumstance you will never lack faith you never have to ask past chaitanya to pray for increase in faith you will have faith in fact you will have it so much in abundance you will start giving it to others your faith is contagious you know that sometimes people with faith inspire more than anything else this one your life is worth considering um, your message will be worth remembering your faith will be worth following um, if you can simply listen to the voice of god today and make the changes that you need to i hope you do that if not for anybody's sake at least for your children's sake let's close our eyes think through this today what you've heard has got to help you to pay attention to his voice so that then what comes out of your life the message that comes out of your life will be worth remembering as god to help you to have a settled heart so that you can then listen to him a heart that is at rest a life that is fruitful most importantly ask god to help you to live in such a way that your faith inspires everybody else around you starting with your own family may god help us let me take this moment to pray with you father i want to thank you god for this afternoon thank you for the opportunity to see that your faith receive your word we tend to forget simple things sometimes so thank you for reminding us that our life should be worth inspiring and it can only inspire people when my message is worth remembering i know that god that unless it comes from you it's not worth remembering so help me to have a settled heart that can pay attention to your voice and fully obey it help me to be a person whose the outcome of whose life people will begin to notice fruitfulness peacefulness and purposefulness and they'd be inspired by my life the outcome of my life they'd consider my life worth remembering i pray that god that as a person as a leader that my life will be filled with faith my heart will be filled with faith and i know i can only have faith if i have conviction help me to be a person with strong conviction deeply rooted convictions about who you are about what kind of god you are 
and what you can do. What a joy it is to see all those heroes who ran this race ahead of us and accomplished what they have accomplished through simply by their faith which is born out of their convictions. Thank you for such great predecessors, God. Help us to leave a good legacy for those who you know, follow us and succeed us. Praise you for this morning and I pray that your words would continue to ring through um, throughout this week in our minds and in our hearts. Well, throughout our life. That we would remember by, that we live by those convictions that God, you are in absolute control of everything. That all things are possible. All things are possible in the name of our Lord Jesus. There is power in His name. There is peace, peace in His name. So we choose to look to you. Thank you for this hour. Bless you, Jesus.